Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. This is part three of the British Heavy Metal series, so make sure you check out the episodes on the Halifax and the Lancaster. Design and Development Now, I had always thought that this bomber had come from the same Air Ministry specification that brought about the Manchester, Lancaster, and Halifax. But no, specification B-1236 was seeking a four-engined heavy bomber with 250 mile per hour cruise, 1500 mile range, and a 1400 pound bomb load. Shorts looked well placed to build a bomber. They already had lots of experience with building big aircraft and were actually working on a couple of four engine flying boats at the time, the Empire and Sunderland flying boats. Here would be a good time to remind you of the Sunderland episode, just in case you haven't already partaken. In addition to the previously mentioned requirements, the new bomber had to be able to take off from, in quotes, backcountry airfields, and it should be able to use catapult assistance for takeoff when heavily loaded. Also, the design should be able to be broken down into sections for rail transport. If that wasn't enough, it needed to be able to be used as a troop transport to fly 24 soldiers to the ends of the British Empire and then supply them with tactical bombing air support. Pretty demanding stuff. Luckily, Shorts had a leg up. The Sunderland was about the right size for the bomber, and so they just copied chunks of it for the new plane, including the wings and control systems. In February 1937, the Air Ministry asked for some changes to the design, asking if the Bristol Hercules radial engine could be used. Also, because of the existing hangar infrastructure, the maximum wingspan had to be reduced from the Sunderland's 114 to 100 feet. In June of the same year, the Air Ministry asked for two prototypes, although they considered the Shorts aircraft, which was now called the S-29, to be the backup of the main contender, the Supermarine Type 316 bomber. Yes, you heard that right. The Supermarine Type 316 was to be the Spitfire's four-engine heavy bomber sister. The Type 316 will be the subject of a future video, but suffice it to say that the Luftwaffe bombing of the Supermarine factory at Wollstone caused destruction of the 316 prototypes and the loss of the construction plans, and so the 316 was cancelled. The Shorts aircraft now was the contender. Prototypes In order to make the shorter wingspan work, the new wing had to have an increased camber, or thickness, to generate more lift to compensate for the reduced span. As a kind of stopgap pre-prototype, Shorts built a half-sized, flyable model of the new bomber and it first flew on the 19th of September 1938. They were mostly happy with the plane's performance, except for the takeoff run, which was too long. In order to improve this, there were a couple of options. One would be to redesign the angle of incidence of the actual wing, essentially increasing the angle at which it was bolted onto the fuselage, which would create more lift during the takeoff roll, thus shortening said roll. But there were some disadvantages to doing this, the main one being that it would require some major design changes which would slow the delivery of the aircraft. Also, the same type of quick fix had been used on the twin-engine Armstrong Whitworth Whitley, which obliged it to fly with a serious nose-down attitude when in cruise. Apart from looking somewhat silly, this resulted in a considerable drag penalty on the Whitley. So Shorts went with the other option, which was to lengthen the landing gear legs, which pushed the nose higher and effectively increased the angle of attack of the wing on takeoff. They tried it on their scale model, and it worked. The long landing gear legs and resulting way up their cockpit will definitely become a obvious characteristic of the new bomber. Anyway, the Air Ministry was happy and ordered the S-29 before the full-scale prototype had even flown. The type was given the name Stirling after the city in Scotland. On the 14th of May 1939, the first Stirling prototype took to the air. 
All was well until this prototype suffered a locked brake on landing, which made the bomber veer off the runway, causing the long spindly landing gear to collapse. Changes were made on prototype number two in order to beef up the gear, but the long gear would always be a problem with the type. Although it had a similar wingspan to the Avril Lancaster and Handley Page Halifax, the Sterling was about 20 feet longer and was taller. Unlike both the Lank and the Halibag, the Sterling was designed from the very start to be powered by four engines, which were Bristol Hercules radials. The Bristol Hercules was a 14-cylinder, air-cooled, sleeve valve radial engine that delivered 1,500 horsepower each. These engines turned three bladed, fully feathering, constant speed metal propellers. This power allowed it to have an impressive bomb load of 14,000 pounds or 6.25 tons. There were three main fuel tanks in each wing, along with a leading edge tank and two trailing edge tanks, this giving 2,254 gallons of fuel. Typically, the Sterling was to be operated by a crew of seven, including two pilots, a flight engineer, a navigator bomb aimer, a front gunner wireless operator, and two gunners. While looking at the operating manual, I noticed that the throttles were listed to be of the exactor type and required special attention. I had never heard of this type of throttle before and did some research on it, and it seems that rather than having a mechanical linkage from the throttle lever to the engine, the link was actually a hydraulic tube and the throttles had to be pulled through in a certain sequence to make sure that the fluid was topped up and there would be no lag in control. For protection, the Sterling mounted eight 303 inch Browning machine guns, two in the powered nose turret that would be manned by the wireless operator, four in a tail turret, and two in the dorsal turret that would be operated by a dedicated gunner. Guarding the belly area was more of a problem. Initially, a so-called ventral dustbin turret was installed, which, as its name suggests, looks like a garbage can that is lowered out of the belly of the aircraft while in flight. The gunner sat within the cramped cylinder and would be able to operate his two guns in a 360 degree arc. However, it looks as though it would generate considerable drag, and also the turret had the unfortunate habit of falling out when the aircraft was taxiing over rough terrain. It was usually removed and replaced by a hatch with a pair of machine guns installed. Later models could have that space occupied by a low-drag, remotely controlled FN-64 ventral turret, which was operated from within the aircraft by a gunner looking through a periscope device. An H2S radar radome could also be installed instead for Pathfinder duties, which will be discussed later. Production The first order for Sterlings had been for 100 aircraft, but as the diplomatic situation with Nazi Germany worsened, this number was bumped up considerably to 1,500. In order to help out, the automobile manufacturers Austin Motors and Roots were also tasked with building Sterlings and eventually there would be 20 factories building the type. There were some plans to build Sterlings in Canada and in 1941 a contract for 140 aircraft was drawn up, but in the end the decision was made to produce Avril Lancasters instead. In total 2,371 Sterlings were built during the war. Operational History Number 7 Squadron at RAF Leeming, North Yorkshire, was the first to receive production Sterlings in August 1940, and by January 1941 they were considered operational with the first combat missions going out on the night of 10 to 11th February. During 1941, 150 more machines were supplied to three more squadrons, and they were used in a variety of night and day roles. Day missions where masses of RAF fighters would accompany the bombers, mainly to provoke a fight with the Luftwaffe, were called circuses. The Sterlings were good for this type of mission as, being the bait, they could take quite a bit of punishment and still get home while the RAF fighters could try to bring down their Luftwaffe opposites. Sterlings were often the pioneers of techniques that would later be exploited by the Lancasters and Halifaxes. One of these was the formation of the Pathfinder Force, or PFF. 
To avoid getting blasted out of the air during daylight hours, the RAF had started bombing by night. But night is a two-edged sword. It hides you in the darkness, but it also hides the target. And Bomber Command was having trouble finding their targets. When a new electronic aid to navigation was developed, called G, the problem was that there were not enough units for all the bombers. So it was decided that certain squadrons, including the pioneering Sterling No. 7 Squadron RAF, would become the Pathfinder Force, and this began in August 1942. After experiment and experience, the technique settled into PFF illuminators using white target illumination flares to mark the way to the target, where other PFF aircraft would identify the actual target and drop colored target indicators. Lastly, backers up, or the fire starters, would drop incendiary bombs to start fires in the proper location of the target area. Then the main force would all aim for the fires. Generally, Sterlings had their advantages and their disadvantages. One major complaint was the behavior of the aircraft during takeoff and landing. All of the tail dragger bombers of the time had a tendency to swing during takeoff, but the swing of the Sterling was particularly bad and was made worse by the long legged landing gear, which could collapse. In order to counteract the swing, the right engine throttles needed to be advanced farther than the left during the first segment of the takeoff roll. Landing was tough too, as the Sterling had the habit of stalling during the landing flare and dropping so hard so as to damage the structure. The RAF was forced to bring in a special training program to certify all prospective Sterling pilots. On the other hand, pilots loved that due to the wing design of the Sterling, the bomber was able to turn very tightly, so much so that they could often outturn the German night fighters that were hunting them in the dark. What the pilots didn't love was that due to the very same thick wing, the Sterling was not able to operate above 16,000 feet, while the new Halifaxes and Lancasters could get up to 24,000 and 28,000 feet respectively. The Sterlings were lower hanging fruit for the German night fighters. Another serious disadvantage that the Sterling shared with the Halifax was that its bomb bay was subdivided into smaller bomb cells rather than having a massive bomb bay like the Lank. The biggest bomb that a Sterling could fit into its cells was a 2,000 pounder. Although this may sound impressive, the RAF began using significant number of 4,000 pound and bigger bombs, called cookies for some reason, and the Sterling just couldn't do this job. As the number of more useful Halifaxes and Lancasters arrived on the scene, Sterlings began to take on other roles. Even their pioneering No. 7 Squadron RAF traded in their Sterlings for Lancasters in May 1943. But Sterlings continued doing useful work. They dropped naval mines in the waters off German ports, an operation known as gardening, they were used in electronic countermeasure missions, dropping strips of metal foil into the air to confuse German radar for operations such as D-Day and Market Garden. They also carried paratroopers and towed gliders. In 1944, a transport version of the Sterling, known as the Mark V, was built with no-tail turret and a new nose hatch installed. 160 of them were built. Before we finish up, we need to mention the S-36 Super Sterling. In 1941, Schwartz started making plans for a follow-up to the Sterling. It would have an increased wingspan of 135 feet and be powered by four Bristol Centaurus radials, which would deliver much more power at about 2,000 horsepower each. It would have a greater payload and be protected with 10 50 caliber machine guns in three turrets. The Air Ministry liked the idea and toyed with the concept by ordering two prototypes. However, as time went on, the decision was made to focus on increased production of Lancasters instead. In August 1942, Shorts stopped working on the Super Sterling. Survivors It is pretty disappointing that of the 2,371 Sterlings constructed, there is not a single intact example existing anywhere, let alone having one in an airworthy or taxiing condition. 
Sections of Sterling's are on display in France and the Netherlands, but for an aircraft that was such a pioneer for the RAF bombing effort, and which did such solid service during the conflict, it does seem a real loss that nowhere can we lay our eyes on this giant aircraft that would be certainly very impressive to see. If you enjoy videos such as these, please send me a super thanks or a like and subscribe to never miss a thing. Until next time.